Well, good afternoon. My name is Chris Barkin, and I want to welcome you all to the William W. Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar here at the University of Illinois. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to take care of a couple of housekeeping items, one of which you probably know. Please turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate so they don't go off during the seminar and disturb the audience or the speakers. If we have a firearm, please exit from these two doors and take the stairs um, down to the first floor. Exit the building, carefully cross the building or cross the street uh, to the north side here and we'll gather next to the hydro systems lab on the opposite side of Main Street. And let's use the buddy system, take a moment to look to your left and right and see who's next to you and make sure that they get out. Um, if you didn't swipe your card or uh, sign the attendance sheet, please do so. It, we need it for accounting regarding uh, reimbursement for the Beats and soft drinks. And also, if you did not receive an email directly from me regarding this seminar but would like to, uh, please make sure you add your name to the list that will go around. I'd like to welcome those of you who are participating via the internet, and today that includes representatives from URS Corporation, Boise State University, Quandle Consultants, uh, Michigan Tech University, Applied Pavement Technology, uh, Hanson Professional Services, the National Association of Railroad Passengers Council, and Penn State Altoona. Welcome all of you. And uh, by the way, those of you who are dialing in, if you wish to receive CEUs for your participation, please uh, send LB Fry an email with your information as described in the email announcement for this seminar. Um, what I would ask, also like to ask all of you is if you have questions, uh, I've spoken to our speaker, and he's, it's an informal seminar, so if you have questions during the seminar, please raise your hands and we'll bring the microphone to you. That way the people uh, in the room as well as participating via the Internet can hear your question. Is Matt Grieve here? But we are, yeah. So. Thank you, Matt. So the William W. Hay Railroad Seminar Series is sponsored by the National University Rail Center here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And on behalf of all of us here at the university, we thank the USDOT for their ongoing support. It's greatly appreciated by those of us here on campus, as well as all of you who are participating via the internet. Now to introduce our speaker, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Professor Errol Tatumler, who's the host of our speaker's visit today and uh, has a lot, lot in common in terms of their research interest. Errol? Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's indeed my pleasure today to introduce to you uh, today's uh, William Hay Railroad Seminar Series speaker. Uh, and he's coming from Tampere University of Technology to us, uh, the Railway Track Structures Research Team at the Tampere University of Technology is conducting research on a variety of important uh, project items. These are cutting edge topics including track components, subsoil stability, structural support, uh, layers, sleepers, rail, wheel rail contact, bridges, and monitoring of track structures. The common aim of this research is to improve the cost efficiency of railway track maintenance from a life cycle perspective. Our speaker today, Dr. Pauli Kolisoya, is ideally positioned to discuss all this work. He has been a professor of earth construction at TUT, uh, Tampere University of Technology, since 2000. Dr. Kolisoya earned both of his master's and PhD degrees at TUT, and after a brief stint with consulting, he returned to the university where his research has included the development of automated devices to measure mechanical behavior of both soils and coarse grained aggregates, ballast materials, material technology in solving design problems of both road and railway structures. And as you can imagine, that's very near and dear to my uh, field and heart. <laughs> so with that, uh, Dr. Kolisoy also served as head of the TUT uh, civil engineering department for almost 10 years, stepping down late last year. Now, he's currently on sabbatical and uh, visiting research groups and formulating a research agenda focused on how to 
benefit life cycle efficient maintenance of transportation infrastructure in Finland and uh, with his visits uh, in abroad actually trying to establish his research group. Please join me in welcoming uh, our speaker today, Dr. Pauli Kolisoya, who will present the Willie May Railroad Seminar today on Railway Track Structures Research at Tampere University of Technology. Uh, thanks a lot, professors, for your kind introduction. I'm really delighted to be here today and happy to see so many of you here. Um, yeah, this is the topic of my, my presentation and, and I have this great opportunity to tell a little bit about the railway res track research, what we have been doing and, and has have going on back home in, in my university. Um, from my previous visits, I, I know that the United States is a big country, and, and I learned to know it also on this visit. It took me two long days and almost two nights to get here from, from Michigan Tech in Houghton, uh, three council flights, and, and finally driving by car to Chicago and then taking the last bus last night here. So I was arriving at hotel half past two, so the reason for my red eyes is not too heavy drinking, but, but uh, <laughs> too, too little of sleep, but, but it's uh, to get the house <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm coming from a pretty much smaller country, Finland, in the northern Europe. You should, should see the location here and also the location of my hometown. So my native language is far different from English. Uh, I hope you will manage with my way of speaking English. <laughs> And the words I'm using may be something not so common you are using, but we will manage it. I will hope so. Um, I think important uh, issue here is the northern location of our country. Uh, the southernmost tip of Finland is exactly on the same latitude as the southernmost tip of Greenland. So we are pretty north. Fortunately, we don't have an ice cap. <laughs> so. <laughs> We have a reasonable uh, climate, uh, but good seasons and, and seasonal variations issues are a big thing uh, related to all kind of in infrastructures, uh, both roads and railways in, in all conditions. My hometown is, is about a quarter, quarter of a million people living in a place looking like this. My campus back home looks like this. I should be somewhere here if I were not here. <laughs> uh, uh, just very briefly, the surroundings where we are doing the research with, with our group, um, so <coughs> Department of Civil Engineering at our university takes about uh, 100 uh, master's students each year. Um, we have a funding of, of about 8 million euro, makes something like 11 million US dollars. The funding for teaching comes from the state, the government, so you know, students are, paying, uh, anything, are not paying anything for, for teaching. And then, then the research funding comes from, from various sources, uh, mainly uh, quite, um, as you will find out in my, my slides later on, uh, much of the research is, is very practically oriented and, and rising from, from uh, practical problems where we are trying to find new solutions. Um, the railway research is, is one of these <coughs> operational units uh, shown here. So we have three, prof three professors uh, on this area. Uh, nowadays my main responsibility is, is more on roads, uh, materials for infrastructures, that sort of things. I used to be working a little bit more also with railways, but, but now the leading guy there is, is my colleague Antti Nurmikolu. He's the man behind <coughs> most of the things what I will be showing uh, you today. Then there is one more professor in, in foundation engineering. And of course, there is a lot of interaction between the groups. Uh, they are not, not silos. They, they are, the people are working on the same 
at the same time, even at the same time, on different areas depending on the ongoing projects. Then I think one very important issue regarding railways is this uh, sort of cross-disciplinary nature of the things what are being done. We have hired some of our students uh, uh, from mechanical engineering from material department of material science because uh, if you go in detail regarding, um, for instance, rails, then you need to understand much more about steel than what, what a normal civil engineer does. So, so this uh, interaction is, is very important. Okay, some <coughs> pictures from our lab. Uh, we are doing quite a lot in the laboratories, uh, also doing quite a lot of monitoring <coughs> of, of full-scale structures on site to verify our, our analysis what we are doing numerically and, and analytically sometimes. So then going into some basic uh, uh, facts about the Finnish uh, railway network, Finland as a railway country. Uh, we are only a five and a half million people altogether, so, so uh, maintaining a um, extensive railway network in, in such a climate conditions what we have is a, is a bit of a challenge. The total track length uh, is uh, something like uh, 5,500 miles, but that includes all the stations and meeting points so that the uh, rail network is something like uh, uh, 6,000 kilometers <coughs> altogether. The gauge, what we have is five feet different from the most of the other European countries. Incidentally, this happens to be the uh, same as, as the Russia has on their railways, and, and the reason is in history, uh, when, when the, the first railways were built in Finland, um, we used to be a part of the, uh, those times, Russian Imperium sort of autonomous area there, and, and that's where the gates uh, is coming. Also, towards the uh, rest of the year, we are like an island, uh, so most of our exports are, are ship borne from the harbors rather than by railways. Um, almost all of our railway lines are carrying mixed traffic, so, so passenger trains and, and uh, freight trains are both using, and, and I would say that passenger trains are more or less ruling the game, and, and, and then um, the freight trains are traveling by night when there is less, less traffic by, by passenger trains. I guess you are a bit different in, in this situ sense in the U.S. Um, most of the railway network is single line, so that, that, that's of course an issue regarding the capacity of, of the network. Um, I, th I would say that we had, have quite high quality um, track uh, on, on, in general, 75% uh, of the network is, is continuous welded and on, on concrete sleepers. Uh, and that's due to the, to the passenger traffic. Um, the maximum speeds what we have uh, are up to 220 kilometers per hour. Uh, not, not on big part of the network. Uh, uh, most of the less trafficked uh, uh, network is, is uh, uh, the traffic speed is something like 140, 160 kilometers per hour. Uh, okay, this shows the railway map. Um, most of the traffic is where the, most of the people are living in, in our country, in the south and in the west. Um, so the maximum axle loads in metric tons, uh, 22 and a half, 25, I think pretty much less than you have here. Um, there is an upgrading process going on um, until 
220 kilonewtons, but I think not beyond that for a long time. Uh, this is the busiest uh, line, especially regarding the passenger trains, uh, where we have this, this um, 200 kilometer uh, speed up until here, and it's, it's being up upgraded right now until all, but it takes a few years to make because it's, it's uh, under the ongoing traffic, so, so it's upgrading is not so easy to do on a single line in that case. Um, the freight transports are, are important for, for the forest industry that's, that's located somewhere here. Then also mining in industries is, uh, has been a booming somehow in the very north part of Finland. One more slide regarding these technical issues. Uh, electrified um, tracks are shown here with red color, so most of the busy uh, traffic lines are, are electri electrified, so, so uh, diesel engines are, are used. Uh, I don't remember the percentage, but, but uh, only on these, these uh, not that much tra trafficked lines. Um, one slide of geology, uh, just to uh, help you to understand why we are focusing on, on things, what we are doing. We used to have an ice cap some 20,000 years ago, two kilometers, two and a half kilometers thick. The ice was melting some 10,000 years ago, and what was left behind is our geology of today, uh, moraine, glacial moraine, uh, uh, all around the country, uh, bedrock pretty close to the surface, only covered normally with a few meters of, of moraine, maybe peat on, on some areas. Then soft soils we have on these coastal areas in the south, south and in the, in the uh, west. And they, they may be up to, up to 20 meters deep and, and soft soil in, in our conditions means really soft uh, we speak about unrained shear strength of, of 10 kilopascal or even less. So it's, a, it's an stability issue, settlement issue on, on infrastructures, pretty much. So um, we don't have permafrost. Yes, yeah, sir. Um, I was under the understanding that um, especially in Finland, because of the glaci uh, former glaciation, the land is rising at a, at least uh, at a geologically phenomenal rate. Um, is that part of your research? Uh, no, no. It's, uh, the rate is uh, somewhere here, it's, it's like uh, 10 millimeters per year. Mm -hmm. uh, down here, it's, it's like three or four millimeters per year. It, it's not an issue. You, you only need to up, up, update now and then the uh, positioning uh, 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 systems what are used uh, to monitor the ground surface because that's changing in in number of ten years or so. But but uh, it's not an issue on geotechnical or, or uh, infrastructural point of view. So we don't have permafrost, but we we have seasonal frost every year. And the frost penetration depth uh, for which the uh, tr railway tracks are designed are half, uh, two meters, two and a half meters in the north. It means huge amount of aggregates, either natural aggregates or, or grass rock, rock aggregates if, if new railway lines are built. Uh, one more slide from history. Um, more recent history than the glaciation is the development of the track length in our country since uh, 1850. Most of the um, lines were already built by, by the Second World War, where we lost some of our, our area to, to our neighbor east in, in the east, and then there has been some, some increase, but now we are somewhere in the six thousand kilometers of, of track length. So this means that most of our existing tracks are far different from, from the 
uh, thing what you can find in the design codes of today. So, so the local materials have been used in, in building the embankments on those times with not that, not that efficient excavators and, and, and transporting equipment. Uh, also, it has been easier to make the tracks on flat ground, so it means that most of the big part of the network is, is on, on soft soil, on peatlands, even though from geotechnical point of view that's, that's the worst scenario, more or less. Uh, excuse me, so is there any specific reason that why the total track dense drop at the middle of, I think, 1930s? Yeah. Is there any specific reason? I'm just uh, a little bit. The total track dense drop a little bit. Yeah. So is there any specific reason? Yeah, th yes, there is. Uh, here we lost 10% uh, of our, our, our land area to so that time Soviet Union. You know, after the war, what we managed to survive, but, but uh, Lost, got some injuries, so so to say. <laughs> yeah, that that's the reason. Yeah. Uh, okay, then um, in a bit more detail regarding the ongoing research on on railways, um, uh, uh, we have um, uh, our main main client. Um, in, in, in the research is the network owner of our rail network, the fr Finnish tra transport agency. And um, right now we have a second phase of a, of a research program, what we have been calling life cycle cost efficient track. Uh, the first one was, was for four years from 2009 to 2012. And now, now we are in the um, first half of the of the second phase. Uh, in both of these these programs, we have tried to cover more or less the whole whole track structure, starting from the more or less from the rolling stock and in the interaction to the to the track, going through all the all the structural layers until to the subsoils, then bridges, of course, and, and this overall economics is then the big challenge to put hopefully one day all these technical things together to make real um, uh, uh, life cycle efficiency uh, starting from technical uh, uh, facts and, and, and phenomena, not, not uh, like inventing the, the service life of different components, but, but to Hopefully one day to be able to, to um, predict the declaration of, of different structural components and, and how it affects the, uh, the total service uh, life and service, uh, uh, service ability of the, of the track. And, and of course the main, main focus is that, that you always have limited resources and, and how to, how to uh, focus the actions you are taking to get the maximum benefit, benefit from, from life cycle perspective. So, so that's the big aim um, of our, our work. Uh, this is a big list of, of uh, projects completed during the first phase. Uh, and um, you will find some more information from our on, from the website of our railway research group. Unfortunately, uh, uh, we don't have um, that much uh, material in English on en everything because our client wants to have the reports in, in Finnish and, and he's not that willing to pay for, for making them again in English, so, so we have been trying to publish in conferences and in journals, but, but uh, unfortunately quite a bit of things are hidden behind the Finnish language, but, but uh, you will find the relevant contact persons on each topic area from our website, and, and then you get uh, more details if, if you really want something.
So on the life cycle cost analysis that you've done, I see slippers. I have a question on the fastening system. Is it included on the, as part of on the slippers, or you did the life cycle cost analysis separately on fastening system? Finally, it should be uh, the life cycle analysis of the whole track system, uh, including all the components. But of course, to be able to do that, you it, you. Um, I think the key things are that you, you need to uh, be able to manage the, the um, response of the, of the truck when it's loaded once, and then you need to have some sort of declaration models for all of the components when the, when the uh, load is applied a million and a number and number of times uh, to see how the conditions condition of the uh, different components uh, develops and, and and then if you I think it would be sort of uh, ultimate thing to do that that um, uh, you could uh, predict beforehand that if, if I'm chasing the proper properties of, of one component like upgrading the rail to a higher weight uh, then how does it affect uh, the responses in the other components of the of the track and how much it it uh, means in terms of their service life, how much benefit uh, you get uh, <coughs> from this action of of changing the rails to to the whole track system you have below the rails. So that's the that's a challenging uh, target, but that's what what we are aiming for. Uh, step by step and, and producing the information with, with our research. Okay, I have, I have some examples more or less from all of these topic areas. Uh, uh, I think this is something not, not very rocket science to you. Uh, we were helping uh, um, traffic agency to, to um, take in use wheel load, uh, wheel impact load detectors uh, some time ago. Uh, until now, we have only one operator, but but the market is going to be open uh, for other other operators. And, and at, the, at at least at that time, then then you need to have means to to quality control the the moving uh, um, vehicles. Um, I'm not uh, very deep in the in the rail issues. Uh, I think the only thing uh, I I would like to mention here here that um, right now we are we are focusing on the on the surface defects. Uh, rolling contact fatigue is something uh, that was considered not to be an issue in in our conditions, but but just recently it has proven out to be and, and, and it's, it's um, one of our key uh, things to do uh, on this topic area right now how big issue it is and, and, and how we should um, change our, the procedures uh, that are causing it nowadays uh, to, to make things better and, and to, to get that problem smaller. Uh, this is uh, just a uh, curiosity, um, snow-related problem. Um, as we have continuous welded uh, tracks, uh, um, the wagons are moving pretty smoothly most of the way. The snow and ice keeps on accumulating into the wagons. Once you get the crossing uh, then uh, or switch, then uh, you have some shaking of the, of the wagons and that's where the ice is falling from the uh, vehicle and, and, and causing problems in the switches. So we are now trying to find how to, how to decrease this accumulation of snow and ice and, and maybe even make some artificial uh, shaking of the of the vehicles before they are approaching the, the switches to, to get the um, uh, ice falling down on safe place, not not on the switches. Uh, 
concrete, concrete sleepers, 75% uh, of our network nowadays. The oldest one are something like 40 years old now. Uh, they were supposed to last for 40 years. And, and the question was now then, should they be replaced or not? We took uh, quite a few old, uh, actually, uh, sleepers with different ages for, for laboratory testing, for in situ monitoring, uh, testing of weathering of the concrete, all kind of things. And, and it proved out that, that even though the sleepers may look like a little bit worn out, they are mechanically they are just perfect, almost like the new ones. So why should we replace them? <laughs> it's it's big money for the for the um, traffic agency if, if if they last 60 years, which I guess guess they will. So so <laughs> good news for our client. <laughs> okay, then moving downwards. Um, Ballast, of course, is, is an important component of the of the track, and, and there has been quite a lot of, of work going on regarding the uh, the uh, decoration mechanisms of, of ballast, and and, and um, uh, if it's getting some day frost susceptible, because that that would definitely be bad news. Um, then. Right now we have things going on regarding the, the, how the tamping affects ballast, uh, how efficient tamping actually is as a, as a uh, sort of repair measure. This uh, figure here shows the application of GPR uh, data, um, making a bit more detailed analysis of the reflected signals, uh, uh, how, how they are coming back from, from uh, uh, ballasts with different quality. Um, the company who is making this uh, um, development uh, in, in that technology is, is a Finnish company, Road Scanners, a very close partner to us in, in many, many projects. Um, and I think we have found a pretty good uh, correlation if we, if we take samples and, and make the uh, falling index analysis from the GPR data. So, so this ena enables us to reduce quite a lot the number of, uh, of samples what we need to take uh, when, when we want to assess the, the uh, ballast quality on a, on a longer distance of, of track. So, so definitely something. Uh, quite useful and also already in, in practical use. I think, uh, yeah, some more GPR related thing here, and, and this is an, a view from the software called Rail Doctor, also developed by, by Road Scanners. Uh, a, a sort of platform to integrate the uh, all kind of uh, uh, position-related information from your track. Like here, they have uh, the track um, geometry data from different uh, uh, measurements along a long time. Clearly, here you have a problem point, something is going on here. What, what's going on there is, is revealed from the... From the um, GPR data, so the um, subgrade stiffness is, is uh, changing dramatically. Actually, actually, here is a bedrock cutting, so so we have a very stiff subgrade here. Here we have an embankment uh, um, below the track. So so also the falling of the of the ballast uh, seems to increase. Uh, as here we have have a fairly thin structure. Uh, the ballast is un underlined by hard bedrock and, and been, uh, it has been, is being hit by, by the uh, sleepers from above. So it's, it's below two uh, <laughs> stiff things and, and getting more falling than, than what we have here. Also, you can integrate 
all kind of lighter uh, information like like the ground surface profiles, uh, further analysis of GPR signals like like analyzing the water content in the embankment. Uh, I think something. This is the way uh, to go somehow to get the, the results practically imp implemented in real world uh, to have efficient tools <coughs> on, on integrating different the information from different sources and, and, and to make the, the sort of analysis somehow reasonable because uh, with all these technologies, uh, as you know pretty well, you are ending, easily ending up with such <coughs> huge amount of information that, that uh, or just, just huge amount of data so that it's, it's difficult to get information <coughs> out of that. <laughs> okay, Frost, that's um, our, our local concern, <laughs> this seasonal frost. Um, we had, um, have these uh, train speeds up to 200 kilometers per hour, so you can't the frost heaves uh, on, on rail, they are typically very local. Uh, if, if frost heave is, is even, you don't notice it, but, but it never happens. But, so frost heave is always uneven, and if, it, uh, if you have like 10 millimeters of local frost heave, you are close to the point that you need to do something uh, like uh, speed limitations. And, and <coughs> our, our railway network is very sensitive to, to uh, speed limits because because everything depends on everything uh, and and the passenger trains uh, if one is delayed then then the whole whole network uh, is is more or less uh, collapsing <laughs> that the schedules are collapsing so so uh, uh, we are not very sensitive on frost heaves but still we have these these uh, embankments that were built decades ago with materials uh, not not always non frost susceptible so so it's a real big issue to find um, methods to assess the embankment quality as well uh, what we have been doing to monitor uh, the frost heaves uh, in situ we see that that uh, when we are monitoring the frost, frost penetration depth at the same time we can see at which, which depth the heave takes place. And then we are taking samples and, and making laboratory frost heave tests in, in, in very ideal frost heave conditions, trying to find correlations between these. And then again, if we could uh, in, um, apply, for instance, uh, GPR to analyze the differences in the embankment where we, we are like to, likely to have these, these uh, uh, frost susceptible so it's uh, okay. You can install, like we are doing quite a lot, uh, frost insulation um, boards on an existing train. As you are sieving the ballast, you put the plates below the uh, ballast layer before it's it's returned back to the into the track. So, but uh, that's an expensive thing to do, and and from environmental point of view, a bit tricky thing because what the life cycle of a frost insulation board is something like 30, 40 years maximum. What to do next when you have, have installed it and, and it's, it's not that easy to remove and it's, it's pretty easy to install. So, so that's something we finally try to uh, avoid but need to do now and then. Okay. Um, Embankments, two meters, two and a half meters thick. How wide they should be, that's an issue regarding how much material you need, how much your track will cost. Um, on that topic, we have been uh, analyzing uh, embankments with differ different widths, different slide slope angles, uh, both full scale in model scale in, in laboratory and by making 2D, 3D finite element analysis. And I think the most important outcome from here 
was the importance of the of the subgrade stiffness uh, uh, that really affects the the shear strains that are mobilized into the embankment, and that affects a lot how much uh, permanent deformation you will have in the embankment, in, in how much widening of the embankment takes place, and and how much decoration of the track geometry you have. So, um, if you have a soft subgrade, then then the deflections are much bigger, much larger. Um, shear strains are developed all through the embankment, and, and it's it's uh, performing worse. Um, this result has already been implemented in our our design codes that if you are making an upgrading of an existing uh, track, um, you can measure the stiffness of the track, and on on stiff subgrade areas, you are <coughs> surviving with with uh, more narrow embankments than what you need on a more more um, uh, soft uh, subgrade. Uh, this was implemented already in one one pilot project, and 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 uh, our client saved um, saved. Um, in that project, I think the money they are using on on ho the whole of our railway research in in 15 years. So, so <laughs> hopefully the results will be <laughs> proved out to be <laughs> true. But but I'm I'm pretty confident that that uh, that uh, it's going to work. They they would otherwise they have been doing the whole thing with with 6.8 meters wide all along. Okay, um, um, modeling of the of the um, whole track structure, including all the components in 3D. That's that's uh, something we ended up uh, on doing. Um, the the first question here was that uh, should we have some um, bearing capacity or load carrying capacity analysis of the track because the frost design is, is decisive all, all the time. We have to we put two meters of, of embankment, non perceptible good quality material, and and the bearing capacity is relates related only only to the width of the embankment. But if you happen to have non frost non frost susceptible subgrade, why on earth you should have two meters? More non first susceptible material on top of that, so so <laughs> uh, that's something um, most likely shouldn't be done anymore. No one has thought about it before <laughs> they have just been doing <laughs> because it has been always always done like that. Um, the thing what we actually ended up here was was uh, so I consider like a tool to analyze this this uh, overall uh, performance of the embankment, uh, how how the components are interacting together, and 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 here I think we can even make a sort of sensitivity analysis that that if I'm I'm chasing the property properties of one of the component in my my track structure, how it affects the the stresses that are realizing in the other components, and and so that's that's more or less what we can do. Already today, but but then, if we still could uh, implement this fatigue or or the, um, decoration models for each of the components, then then we would be close to the ultimate target of our work, sort of life cycle technical life cycle design of the of the track. Okay, stiffness that's important, as I said. Uh, it's pretty easy to measure it uh, at one point by LVDTs or acceleration transducers, whatever you like to use. But uh, that's only place specific information, and, and what you're interested in is, is what is the stiffness on the whole of your network. This is the device what we have, we have been developing for that. It uh, enables uh, stiffness measurements with the speed of uh, 50, 60 kilometers per hour, so so not that much uh, 
causing trouble to the, to the other, other traffic. And, uh, and with this, you can easily find the, the problem sites, what you have on the, on the line. This is just an example of an approach embankment on a bridge. The bridge is here. Somewhere has been severely wrong. Next to the bridge, uh, the uh, display reco recoverable displacement in vertical direction has been something like 10 millimeters or even more. Must be almost frightening to the to the locker driver because the <laughs> track is yielding <laughs> below. They say that it, they feel it if 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 you have a have a real poor uh, approach embankment. Then they have done something and, and now it's more or less, less okay. Um, then moving on to the subsoil, I think this is the most exciting thing I have had an opportunity to be involved in my professional life. Uh, we made a full scale failure test of a uh, 60 meters piece of railway track lying on a soft subgrade. Uh, in this small picture, the wagons, the containers filled with sand have al already been falling down. This area here was heavily instrumented with purposes, displacement, hori horizontal, vertical, whatever you can imagine. This ditch where we are cutting to be sure that the, the failure uh, surface will end up here. So, so that was just to sort of back up <laughs> to do. Um, and what we did uh, should be shown. Maybe you can help here. <laughs> On a little video you can see on YouTube. So this is the experiment we made a couple of years ago. Um, here they are filling the, the containers gradually, uh, one increment of load at a time, and, and we are continuously monitoring the, the instrumentation and, and seeing if, if something is, is going to happen. And, and um, we were lucky in our predictions in such a way that, that um, uh, the containers were just big enough to, to um, have that amount of sand in, I in, in them as we have something starting to happen. And, and that's where we, we stopped. You know that, that uh, soft soil behavior is, is uh, uh, time dependent heavily, so, so then we just kept on waiting. And um, it, it finally became night before something happened, but, but uh, fortunately we had good lights on, on the side, so, so we could catch the, the failure itself. Of course, it was just an impressive thing to see all, all the important uh, information we got, of course, from the, from the instrumentation, what we have, have uh, on, the, on the soil. So, so this is near to the final end. Now it's going. Almost going. <laughs> yeah, this first part of the train will, will fall first. Now it goes. Wow. <laughs> okay. I think it will show it again if you didn't get the right feeling at first. <laughs> See? 
So it, it failed. Uh, I think quite nicely what what we planned and and, and the instrumentation. Yeah, it, it succeeded pretty fine. So 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 this um, this experiment. It was an expensive one, but but um, uh, <laughs> yeah. But still, definitely it was worthwhile because because uh, it has uh, enabled us us uh, quite a bit of uh, further developing of the methods that we are analyzing on the on the subgrade stability of, of the embankments. Uh, as I said, uh, um, most of the existing tracks are on, on, not most, but much of the existing tracks are on, on uh, sub, soft subgrades. And, and if you want to upgrade the track, uh, track uh, on higher axle loads, you need to ensure about the stability. And, and what they're doing nowadays with two inaccurate um, um, approaches that, that uh, they are making, uh, I'm not sure about the term in English, if you are counterbalancing the, the action of the uh, weight of the embankment with berms, is berm, yeah, uh, building on sides of the embankment. They are making huge of those because the uh, clay layers may be up to 20 meters deep, so the slip surface may go very wide, and, and they are building uh, like 10 to 30, 40 meters wide berms from both sides of the uh, track when upgrading a, a difficult pl place of a, of a track. And uh, if you can save 10 meters or 20 meters there, it, it means means a lot of money, and, and, and definitely that, that's something they, we will be able to do. So this was worthwhile, even though it was expensive, but it was nice. <laughs> okay, can I move back to the slides? I only, I only have, a, I think, two more slides, so I'm almost at the end. Okay, um, I think still a couple of words uh, regarding the, the bridges. Uh, this is an old, about 100 years old uh, brid bridge deck to the laboratory and, and tested until failure. Uh, the type of the structure is that there are quite heavy steel beams and then they have been just casting concrete around them. Uh, the design on those days has been made that the, the steel is, is taking all the load. They don't have considered it as a, as a composite structure at all and, and it proved out to be that the capacity is like four times than required, so so there are quite a few of those on the network, and, and uh, I think from now on we are not quite happy with those those uh, bridges. Uh, they are they are not a big risk if if you have four times capacity what you need. So <laughs> um, then well, I think this is well, the last slide, um, um, and showing a full scale experiment regarding integral bridges, integral um, abutment bridges, uh, meaning that, that there are no bearings on the, on the bridge, but the uh, ends of the bridge are resting directly against the embankment. And, and, and then, of course, the temperature movements are, are playing a role there. Uh, how, how the question is actually how, how long you can build that sort of bridge. Uh, this, this was a short one, but, but uh, on, a, on a track that was, was built at that time, it, it was an uh, open playground for us. Um, this picture is from a highway bridge, but, but showing the type of instrumentation, what we had to monitor the earth pressures when, when we were dragging these, these wagons, which had brakes on, on the brick deck, uh, and then mobilizing quite a bit of horizontal force here and, and monitoring the interaction between the embankment and the, and the bridge structure, how the, how the interaction takes place. So that was, was the issue here. Oh yeah, I would like to advertise our railway research group merits. We had an international research assessment some years ago and, and railway re structures group was, was notified as one of the 
cutting edge research areas in our, our university, so it was nice. So this is our new construction just to be finished by next spring when our university will have its 50 years anniversary. So that was all. Thank you. Are you the major technical university in Finland? If you ask me, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who is your competition? Um, the current uh, Alto University, which is with, uh, part of which is Helsinki University of Technology, so in, in Helsinki. They, if you ask them, they may say something else. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a question. Um, thanks for the pr presentation. I can understand uh, Finland is uh, fighting against uh, lots of uh, extreme cold weathers. Um, so I'm wondering, I'm curious that uh, do, do you encounter any like perma permafrost issues like? No, no, no. Oh, okay. we permafrost we have only in very, very um, single points in the, you see Finland is a bit like, like this. So in these fingers here, <laughs> If you have peat uh, uh, that is keeping the um, uh, uh, soil frozen also during summertime, then, then you may have some problem first. On, on roads, we have some spots, but not on railways, not any. Any more questions? We have a question from somebody who's dialing in. Okay. Um, it's a question about uh, the um, decision you make or the railways make about using um, low, medium, or high carbon rails um, with an emphasis on Brunel hardness. Do you are your people working on Brunel hardness at all? Oh, oh, that's that's too difficult for me. <laughs> I I I would just advise. Uh, 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 to have a look on our web website, the, the, the contact persons are found there. Yeah. Antti Nurkolo, our professor, or, or Riku Varis is the other, is the PhD student who is working on that area. Okay. Thank you. Um, I had a question which was, I, I think some of the things that you were describing parallel a lot some of the work that um, uh, Riley and some of his students are working on regarding what they call mechanistic design. I guess um, when you talk about the research on evaluating the, tr the track structure and the track structure requirements in terms of the actual loads that are being applied, do you have any sort of initial findings, especially as it might affect your mixed use lines? Are there problems that you're that are becoming evident that are maybe a, a tied to the fact that they're mixed use lines and therefore Combining both speed and, and tonnage. I think uh, yeah, yeah. The, we have this challenge of optimizing all the time, time between the different uh, uh, needs. Uh, so, <coughs> um, I think the focus is is. Uh, uh, with limited resources, it's, it, it is and it's going to be on the, on the uh, main physics lines. And, and, and there is uh, quite a lot of discussion of even closing some of the, of, of the uh, so not so much <laughs> traffic lines and, and moving the tra transports on, on wheels uh, on, on those areas. So priori prioritizing of, of things to the main uh, networks and, and, and then, uh, then I think trying to find the uh, means to optimize the use of, uh, to optimize the actions you, what you are doing on, on, on the um, track, uh, on those main tracks. So that's the, new, the big aim all, all the time. What are your major aggregate types you use for ballast? <coughs> um, for, for ballast, um, um, okay, we have um, 
Altogether, we have uh, access to uh, hard bedrock uh, very easily all around, but, but uh, the quality of the bedrock um, good enough for ballast is, is only in 5% of the resources. So, so on some places, it, it, it's a bit of a challenge to find the, the place to get good quality aggregate. Uh, I think most typically they are, they are granites. Uh, then gneiss uh, types uh, may be sometimes okay, but, but mo mostly granites, I would say. We have another, another question from one of our online participants from Penn State Altoona. Uh, they want to know, um, is, the, and I th is the Finnish railway infrastructure owned by the government? Yes, that's right. Are the trains operated by the government? No, no. Um, it, it's a sort of a process going on. Uh, the current situation is that, that uh, we have only uh, one uh, operator that's a state-owned uh, company, totally with, with its own bookkeeping and, and in, in such a way separated from the government. But they are basically the, sa the same organization that once used to be the part of the uh, government uh, rail organization. So uh, now we are in a process of, of opening the market uh, to competition, but um, I think with, with uh, this um, small country, that small of uh, traffic volumes, uh, uh, transport volumes, uh, uh, it's, it's going to be a long process because uh, uh, we have the different uh, gates, so no one from, from uh, Western Europe can just come on our, we have different systems. So, so um, it's a big investment to come into the market. What, what I could uh, see to happen maybe one day is that, that uh, uh, one of the, one of the forest, big forest companies is making a contract with someone uh, to take care of day transports from the factories to the harbors. Uh, but even that, I think, uh, is not going to happen in five or ten years. So, do you have interchange traffic with the Russian railways, though? Uh, we have, yes, yes. Uh, uh, actually, um, qu quite a bit of uh, Russian uh, uh, rolling stock is moving on on the on our rails, but but uh, they are changing the loco locos at the border. So, so the oper operator is, is the Finnish rails company. On, on the Finnish side, but the, yeah, the Russian uh, rolling stock—that's a concern because because the, uh, and and one of the main reasons why why we were introducing these wheel load impact detectors because that's that's a way of, of uh, quality control and to, and to stop the worst flat wheels and and that sort of things uh, not to enter our 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 rails because, because they are damaging. Uh, there is uh, the main transports coming from Russia are, are crude oil uh, to a big refinery, what we have in the southern coast, and then uh, some uh, iron ore further north uh, across the Finland uh, to the one of the harbors up there. So, mm, so there's uh, some, I think these two specific uh, uh, things that are, are operated by the, by the Russian uh, wagons. And the, the follow-up question from Penn State was, can you speculate on how the fact that the state owns the infrastructure, does that affect the emphasis of your research, do you think, or? Um, um, you may, uh, Having not operated in the system, in a system where there's private sector ownership of infrastructure, it might be hard for you to compare, I realize. Yeah, 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 that's right. Um, so, uh, um, I, th I think um, mm, the state ownership is, is uh, somehow a um, good thing for us because, because uh, um, I think um, we can um, truly help uh, to, to truly aim to sort of uh, optimize the um, 
uh, maintenance of the whole system, not, not just optimizing the profits on some, some time scale. So, so, um, um, and, and it's, of course, state is a non-profit organization, so, so I think in, in our conditions it, it's a pretty logical uh, solution what we have ended up. And I, I, I can't uh, imagine that to happen for, for quite a bit of time that, that uh, the ownership of the rails would, would be prioritized. And I have a sort of related follow-up question myself, which is how much, what's, how much funding comes in to your university for highway research compared to rail? I saw the numbers you have for rail. Is highway funded at a higher level or about the no, same level? No, hardly at all. Ah. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a long history. history. We used to have very active uh, highway research uh, some uh, uh, 2015 years ago, but uh, uh, yeah, then there, were, there was a policy of the, of the uh, road authorities uh, in the beginning of, of uh, this millennium that, that uh, uh, the owner of the road network gives up on financing research. Uh, it's, it's the business for the, for the companies. Uh, the contractors, uh, okay, even child should understand that, that uh, the timescales are different. Uh, uh, the owner should look for a decades-long per perspective and, and the companies have their perspective much shorter. So, so they never started funding research. The government <laughs> stopped funding and, and that caused uh, more or less uh, total dying of, of our highway infrastructure research, so, so it has been a bit like collecting berries from here and there, uh, um, like European fund Union funding, uh, some, some pr projects. I think it's, it's, now it's, it's uh, going to improve because the, on the ro road network, uh, yeah, the challenges, I think they are, the foreseeable challenges are even bigger than, than on, on rails. Uh, the network is large and, and, and how to maintain it cost efficiently. I think that's, that's on my agenda in the next five to ten years, more or less, <laughs> the key thing there. Hopefully things will get better, but, but uh, nowadays the situation is re real sad concerning road research. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you.